Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington, and Emma Turner, who you can see on your screen. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled today to be talking to one of our shared idols, heroes, <laughs> someone we respect enormously and we're really excited to talk to, Mary Meyer. So welcome, Mary. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be with you and uh, having the chance to have a chat about all things dead important in education. Yeah, and what, I know, I mean, we, we don't really want to sort of pull away the, the veneer of, of uh, you know, production values, but last time I spoke to you and you looked like that, actually you were sitting in a car. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. So where, where, where are you actually? I know it sounds like you're, you're in a sort of multicoloured world there, but where are you really? So I am at home at the moment, but um, I do regularly record uh, wherever I am. And sometimes that means uh, doing it in the car. So I did one with Sam Strickland a few weeks or so ago. Couldn't make the time scale work to get back in time. So uh, I just put a screen behind me and uh, off we went. It's, it's amazing what this stuff can do now. It's just great. <laughs> <laughs> you could be anywhere, Mary. <laughs> No, it's fantastic. So one of the things about our particular uh, podcast and uh, YouTube show is that we are sort of a transatlantic um, uh, platform. You know, we have a lot, half of our guests that come from the US, half from the UK, and that's what we're trying to do. So uh, you're, you're famous. People who are sort of engaged with Twitter and, and follow the kind of edgy Twitter world will know a lot about you because you're sort of celebrated by a lot of people. And also... Um, you know, you write lots of books, but if you, if people in the US who, who are tuning in, um, who may or may not have heard of you, uh, and what, what, how would you describe yourself? You know, what's your kind of, what, what kind of, what do you say to people when they say, what do you do and what, what's your whole sort of thing? Well, I suppose at the heart of it is I'm just gripped with the, the, the soap, the soap opera and the drama of the educational world. And um, so it just means I'm completely absorbed by it. But my background, just the headlines of it is, um, I'm an RE teacher by training. Um, but I've also taught some a uh, bit of maths, a bit of English, some history and some Latin at lunchtime. Um, and then I've done some work for local authorities. I was with the local authority in Suffolk um, in, for about 10 years. And then for the last 10 years or so, I've been working as an independent, uh, sometimes in schools, supporting schools, sometimes as an uninvited guest when I was working for the inspectorate. And um, really just trying to to make sense of what I see that's going really well and then identifying some of the barriers for all of us doing our best work, um, I write about it. So it's really just to clarify my own thinking that some of this ends up in blogs and books and one or two people find that helpful. So um, I, just, I just think it's one of the most interesting spheres to be involved in, have your life's work um, shaped by what's going on. There's never ever a dull moment. There's always something interesting to think about. So you, are you finding that you're, so it, what, what's the most common thing that people ask you to do? So you, I know, you, you, I mean, like me, we've done a few things where we kind of set up a platform and we sort of tell our story that we want to tell about curriculum. But when, you, when, when people are coming to you and say, Mary, come and help us, what, what sort of things are they asking you to help them with? Um, so it's generally sort of shaping the narrative about getting priorities right. Um, I mean, I'm quite often asked to, you know, to, to shape things up for an external audience. And I don't just mean the inspectorate, but, um, you know, maybe for governors or, or, or parents, whatever. And I just, I just always say, well, you know, shape things up for the, to get the right things done for your pupils and students and the rest then follows. Um, so sometimes it's more specific in terms of uh, curriculum planning and um, more detailed work. So this morning um, I've had three hours with a primary school um, talking about religious education in primary and working up some plans for them. But that's very um, subject specific work is um, unusual. Mostly it's more generic systems and leadership and accountability stuff that I do. And that's um, more recently been um, uh, for large conferences, keynotes, etc. And so um, it just seems that there's um, an audience for um, straight, straight talking, really, and telling it as it is and stop mucking about with stuff that's not making any difference. Surprisingly enough, people want to hear that. 
They do. So one of the things, this is my, my last question, and I'll, Emma, I'll come in afterwards. But I, I, I just, this is what I love about you, because I'm going to tell people, this is what, I, I've, I listen to you talk lots and lots of times. Sometimes we're on the same kind of platform, you know, live conference or, but one of the things I think you, you have is you kind of, you kind of have this way of bringing in a kind of accountability edge into what you're saying. So you have a kind of, like a quality threshold and you sort of, you have a sort of message, which I think is quite subtle, but important, which is that, there is an accountability. We need to do things right. Um, and you say things to people which you get away, which I don't think I could, which is you say things like, it's just not good enough, colleagues. <laughs> and the way, you, the way you say it makes people go, God, no, she's right. You know, I get it. I, it's not good enough. But you say it in a way which makes people motivated to go and do things better, not make them say, leave us alone you with your accountability don't you know they don't get defensive now how what isn't that interesting that you i so my, my question is why is it that we need to sort of to get the spirit of that right in order for well, people to kind of do it yeah that's really interesting and i have paid quite a lot of attention to that because um you know i come from the threshold is that this is never a blame game because i think you know those of us involved with bringing along uh, young people we're all we're I think we're all in it for the right reasons um, but sometimes we don't know what we don't know and so when I'm talking about things I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up stuff that just um, is I think we've just got to have the highest quality materials that we offer our children and sometimes stuff slips through the net because people are rushed so they they draw down dodgy um, third-rate um, material from the internet without any kind of quality assurance. So I'm just sort of laying some of that out and saying, you know, we've all fallen into this trap, but why would I do this low-grade diet when actually, with a, just a shift of perspective, they could have something absolutely fabulous? And so um, what I'm trying to do is sort of lay it out there as a sort of third party rather than anyone, and we critique it. Um, but then nobody should feel, oh, well, she's having a go at me. Because guess what? Everyone has made mistakes, and I include myself in that. So I think um, it needs to be said, but it needs to be said from a place of humility from the part of the person who's actually articulating it. And so I'm always really clear um, and very open and honest about the mistakes I've made. Um, because I think when you do that, when you've got any kind of profile whatsoever, that um, it, it shows that that person is not coming from a place of judgment. They're coming from a place of actually, can we sharpen this up? Um, but I, equally, I won't, I won't shy away from it because, you know, our kids deserve the best. And paradoxically, giving them the best, when we've thought that through, it's actually less work for us. So quite often we're overworking on things that are not making enough difference to children's learning. <laughs> and um, so, so yeah, and it's just helpful that, that I, I, I think I, I'm, I mean, I'm rubbish at lots of things, but I think I'm quite good at making that sort of message land reasonably well. But I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of um, reading and, and writing about this. I do think it's possible to be both robust and kind. And the kindness has always got to come first. And um, Kim Scott's radical candor is really helpful here that you, you know, you care personally, you challenge directly. And when you've got that in place, you can move mountains. And I know because I've been on the receiving end of it, you know, people who've been quite judgmental about my work and I've become defensive. But people who show that they actually care about me as a person are actually much tougher about the work. <laughs> And they'll take that on board because it's not making me feel um, stupid or dumb, which is very easy to do if we don't choose our words wisely. I was so engrossed there, Mary. I was <laughs> going off on little flights of fancy in my own head. Um, I remember seeing you speak quite a few times. And every time I've seen you speak, I've been writing furiously and worshipping at the altar of, of Mayat <laughs> as you speak. But one of the things that I always come away with, because you have this kind of um, queen of the curriculum kind of uh, persona. And I, the question I really wanted to ask you is, why do you think so many people are getting themselves into such a ravel about curriculum? Because there must have been millions and millions and millions of blogs, of articles, of uh, publications, all written about curriculum. But it's almost like, 
some schools have got themselves in such a ravel that they can't then make that decision about their curriculum. So how do you unravel that? So that's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, so I think it's worth um, saying that certainly in England, the reason it's gone so much further up the agenda is because of um, Ofsted having it now in the latest inspection framework from September 2019 and sitting within there is the quality of education. And a big thread of that is the curriculum and whether we're asking ourselves the questions about whether it's sufficiently ambitious and appropriately demanding for all our children. So that's the reason why in, in England um, it has gone further up the agenda. The issue with that is that um, it, it lots, lots of schools um, do need to sharpen up why they're teaching what they're teaching. It, you know, it's more than for the exams. It's more than just because it's been downloaded from the internet. It's more than just because it's on a scheme, um, you know, a national scheme or whatever. It's about, well, what do our children need and why are we justifying teaching this and what would happen if they weren't taught this? And so it's these um, bigger rationale that is going on. But the fact is that across the world, whether in England or anywhere else, there's always been good work going on on the curriculum. And so I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I think this layer of pressure um, for those schools that might have um, not paid attention to the substance and the quality of the substance, um, as they might have done, um, are having to do some hard thinking, which is not the same as masses of busyness and activity. Um, and I think it can become um, overwhelming and confusing. And that's just a pity because there's actually um, some fundamental questions that we can ask ourselves that start then shaping that. So for instance, you know, if we're working on a new topic and we ask ourselves, well, the, one of the phrases which I think is quite helpful, which is emerging from inspection in England is, you know, why are we teaching this? Why now? So why are we teaching this at all? What's it going to do for young children in terms of their intellectual and um, cognitive development? And why are we teaching it now? So what might have needed to have happened before or how is this going to lead to something else later on? So once we start having those conversations, the scales start falling away. And so that's one thread. The second thread is, well, what are some of the big ideas sitting behind this unit? or this topic or this series of lessons that we're teaching. Because um, when children are taught explicitly the concepts and the big ideas, that starts creating coherence, um, primarily within them. Because if they don't have the big concepts or the big ideas, then it's just random stuff without any connections. So we pick out the big ideas. Great news on that is, is that within any unit or any sequence of lessons, there aren't masses of them. There might only be one. But once we've identified that, paid attention to it, unpicked, say, the etymology of those concepts, we're then beginning to get clarity about what needs to be taught. So I, so I think it's quite often it's stripping down to say, what is it that I want my children to have learned as a result of this? And then making sure that any kind of implementation, as we, we call it over in, in England, um, is, is um, a sufficiently high quality underpinned by great conversations, high quality talk. So it's a journey. It is, um, it's not something that can be done in one staff meeting or one faculty meeting, um, but it's about distilling what we're, what we're planning to teach and, and the rationale for it starts sort of cutting away the nonsense. And I think also to relax into that, um, finally, is to say that we've got to get over the idea that we can teach everything. You know, and so, you know, what I call the curse of content coverage, I've got to get through all this. Yeah, but why? Because <laughs> you know, if we race through, then, um, you know, it hasn't had a chance for children to sit, for it to sink in. Whereas if we pay attention to the big ideas, then when we teach something else later on, we can refer back to that in a very organic um, and intentional way. So um, fewer things, greater depth starts to peel away some of the um, detritus that's sitting around some of our thinking around, around curriculum planning. It's interesting. No, go on. I was going to say about curriculum, like something occurred to me in the shower this morning, actually. 
I was thinking about curriculum. I was thinking about the arguments that people have with other people's curriculum in school. And I was thinking, do you think it's a bit like a diet? Like every school needs a nutritious curriculum diet. And then people just start squabbling because somebody's following this type of diet and somebody's following that type of diet. If you're ultimately all healthy, then does it matter what's in your diet? And then I started thinking about the fewer things in greater depth. What would you have in this diet? And what would you have in that diet? I don't know whether I'm totally barking up the wrong tree there, Mary. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't picked up that people are disagreeing. I'm, I'm probably uh, I'm following different. My timeline might be different from yours. Um, it's a shame. It's a shame if people are because um, Twitter is the most brilliant space mm -hmm. for thrashing some of this out in a respectful way, yeah. and um, so we don't need any copycat um, work going on on the other hand there's no copyright on good ideas mm -hmm. and so we uh, appropriate those where we think that they're going to be useful um i think one of the things certainly in england is that um we need to be thinking about well what do the children in this community need yeah okay and so in england we have the national curriculum that's a national entitlement um for maintained schools um and academies don't need to follow that but um the expectation is that uh, they will, their curriculum is at least as ambitious, that's not more content, as ambitious as the national curriculum. So the national curriculum is kind of given. Um, but then beyond that, so what might be missing? So are some of our children, for instance, coming into school with low levels of literacy and oracy, um, which by the way, is not just a children from um, more disadvantaged backgrounds. Some of them are fine. Um, many of them are, in fact. Uh, quite often it's children from more prosperous backgrounds who are coming from homes where no one has a conversation with them. Um, but if we've identified that as a school, then how are we making sure that the curriculum is brought alive through really rich, high quality conversations, wonderful texts, wonderful literature, real joy in the love of, of the word, the, wrote, the written word, and the spoken word or we might alternatively I've identified that some of our children are coming into schools with quite um, narrow-minded attitudes towards people who are different from them and so um, how do we include in part of our curriculum material that is going to um, open that out for debate and discussion so you might include something like the wonderful resources from Lifter, world-class um, films and documentaries very moving but also very funny about different individuals from different communities that start cracking open some of those stereotypes so it's this sort of nuanced thinking of what it is that our children need rather than thinking well they've got something nice over there i think i'll just appropriate that for my for my setting i once had a frightful example of this i mean it was some years or so ago now but i was working in a school in suffolk and a relatively new head and the previous head had left uh, moved out of the country and um, the, uh, he said <laughs> a previous head uh, used to look at all the Ofsted reports those are the inspection reports in England for the local area and um, ones that were good or outstanding he just used to pick off things that he thought were a good idea just plop them in his school so they ended up with a recording studio because one of the schools had a recording studio when I went there it was gathering dust because nobody used it and then his head said, he said, and then he visited a school that had a farm. I said, don't tell me you've got a farm. He said, yeah, built a farm. I said, is it being used properly for the curriculum? No, it's been used as a petting zoo and we're, 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 we're shifting the animals on. I mean, it's this sort of superficial dropping in um, rather than coming from a deep space of actually this is what our children might need. It's interesting you say that because one of the things I think is fascinating is almost there's so much there are more degrees of freedom than sometimes people acknowledge like you imagine sometimes people talk about sort of being shackled and stuff and i and i think there are things like the if, if there's a, a standardized test and we need to, to teach children what fronted adverbials are for an exam that feels like like an imposition of a kind of a grammar agenda which is one type of thing but i so i understand that's there but actually all the primary schools i go to and when you see people writing it feels to me like phenomenally wide open in terms of the books the topics and then actually the national curriculum is in there and it has created a kind of framework so you often do come across people talking about benin because that's one of the examples romans and 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 so on and and so there is that kind of commonality whereas when i spoke a couple of weeks ago to 
E.D. Hirsch to Don Hirsch. And he's kind of like really banging the drum of, you know, we have done anything close to this in the US. Like it's, there's so much diversity there that he's worried that it's even affecting the sense of national identity because people have such atomized idea of what should be in the curriculum. So what's your view of that? You know, what's the role of the national curriculum to provide a structure? And, yes, and, so and, I, I understand Hirsch's concerns about that and, and um, he alludes to those mm. in his latest book as well. Um, and, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why you've got the Core Knowledge Foundation to try and uh, um, meet some of that need. But the point is it's not statutory uh, in the way that the national curriculum is. So um, my view on the national curriculum um, is that there is a lot of freedom in there uh, beyond the English and the maths. And um, so, which is pretty prescriptive. I think it needs to be because, you know, those are the, the building blocks. I would just say that um, my understanding is, is at the end of key stage two, all that spaggy stuff, which I think is quite important actually, and I think taught well, it can be, um, you know, great for kids, but in fact it is important. It was meant to be developed into key stage three and they ran out of time. So I gather I might be wrong. One of my, the listener might come back and say, no, that wasn't I mean, the case. Punctuation there. and grammar, that's the spag, you mean, isn't oh, it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but that, you know, the, the, we can't have our children leaving school without being able to read and write and talk and, and uh, know their numbers. But beyond that, when you look at the national curriculum documents, apart from history, and that's because Michael Gove, the former um, education minister, who actually I think did a lot, I actually think he did a lot of good, good work. Um, and he was an historian, I think. But anyway, he, he made sure there was loads of content in there. Uh, actually, most of it's very good. And, and a lot of it is um, beyond the mandatory bits. So there's a lot of freedom within there. But you look at the art and design or you look at the design technology, huge amounts of freedom. So I don't think it is over bloated. And I think there are a lot of um, opportunities to do uh, really interesting um, and localized work as well. So I think it's a good combination between the national and the and the local. I think in lots of in lots of respects. Do you think it's do you think curriculum then is about developing curriculum confidence with teachers and leaders? Confident in the content, confidence in the sequencing, confidence in the underpinning concepts. Do you think it's actually about developing teacher and leader confidence with curriculum? Yes, I do. Um, and, and that is because um, that the kind of accountability narrative, and I don't just mean in relation to the inspectors in England, but the way that schools have kind of had around the published examination results um, without looking at what necessarily feeds into those results. And so I think people have... I'm not talking about every school, but I think across the sector, I think it's possible to generalize and say that the focus on the curriculum and the content and the justification for that content is a relatively new piece of um, leadership um, modus operandi and thinking. Um, and that's fine, so, but it just takes time to get, to get used to it. Um, but it's about asking different questions of leaders asking different questions than they have in the past of teachers and subject leaders or subject coordinators of, um, within primary schools. So instead of saying, well, um, what percentage of your children um, have um, uh, crossed the threshold of this number of points or sublevels, um, you know, what did that even mean? You know, so we, we, we got as a, as a sector, I think, quite comfortable with using proxies and I would say very flawed pseudo proxies for actually what children were learning and that's largely around um, data collection rather than what was sitting behind what we had taught the children. So yeah I think it is a shift and I think it is about confidence but um, what I'm noticing is that um, those schools um, and people working in the schools that, um, are going into this wholeheartedly or recommitting to it wholeheartedly, actually really quite excited about it because it's very stimulating, it's intellectually very stimulating. And I think what needs to sit around that is how leaders um, create the space for this work to happen. Because I think certainly in England, 
new ways of thinking or new um, important work. Uh, so, well, we've got to all work on this. Yeah, but what are you going to stop doing? We don't do that enough. And so, you know, we overburden ourselves intellectually and physically if we're not very disciplined about cutting back on some of this. Tom, I don't know if you find that uh, uh, in relation to confidence. Um, with, yeah, hugely. With colleagues. I, I find it fascinating. One of the, one of the things that uh, I've, I've learned doing my work is um, the, the primary and secondary uh, so you know elementary and high school teachers have slightly different views of this so you've got specialism and generalism and so in a, in a secondary school you know you've got teachers teaching sometimes a very wide range and in England it's very different to America in America like you have teachers who might say they're a grade eight you ask them what they do they say oh, I'm a grade eight maths teacher sometimes seven and eight amazing focus so you get really good at teaching for that age group Whereas in England, you've got people who are teaching maths from year seven to year 13. And so never really repeating anything. And that's quite a, a skill set. In primary, you've got people teaching the year four, everything. And one, one of your big things, like your, your book, the, the one before, the one, we haven't talked about the books, but we will in a minute, but the, the, the Gallimore to Coherence, this idea of coherence suggests that you need to kind of have quite a big frame for the curriculum like this fits into a wider map but if you're a year four teacher teaching maths writing history geography the art you know how much capacity you've got to know this little topic fits into a wider frame and studying the year before the year after it's pretty demanding isn't it i mean it's almost like an unrealistic goal or is it yeah, so, it, you know, the bandwidth, I think, is, is much wider in primary. And I do think that is, uh, I think, capacity even to think deeply about the breadth of subjects that uh, need to be taught can be a barrier. But it doesn't necessarily follow that it is a barrier. And so, I mean, this is where I think that uh, two things are important. One is to take account of the cognitive science, which is never a three-line whip, it's never ultimate proof, but, um, you know, to quote Dylan William, um, can indicate some best bets. So beyond the concepts, which is um, an important thread of um, em emerging from the cognitive science, um, is the importance of stories. And so when we really understand the literature behind the power of stories, and when I talk about stories I'm including high quality texts whether they are fiction or non-fiction. The power they have to take children deep to support long-term learning and so once we've got these kind of hacks <laughs> that take us in deep then we can start um, making that bandwidth uh, more manageable. So that's one strand. So traditionally what's happened in England is people think, well, stories are a lovely idea and we drop them in when we can. It's like, no, this is fundamental. And one of the issues, one of the barriers around using stories, and I, by the way, secondary as well, but I'm thinking particularly in primary planning, is that they're enjoyable. And so it's what Claire Seeley calls, you know, the collective cuddle. We've all had it, haven't we? When we're reading a story to a class and this magic atmosphere comes over it. And so we ask ourselves, how can something so enjoyable be work? But it is. <laughs> We've convinced ourselves we need to be busy preparing differentiated coloured worksheets that are going to widen gaps instead of finding a really good text. So, you know, it's not just something which is a nice thing to do. I'm arguing it is fundamental in terms of planning in primary and into key stage three. Across the, across the curriculum, there's great stories in maths. Not that I would underpin um, complete units with maths, but um, with, with stories in maths. But every other subject, this is a legitimate thread. So that's one strand. The second strand is, is that you cannot have primary school teachers working on their own. It's just too much. Now, the, the problem is, is that, you know, if you're in a secondary school and you're leading on a subject, you generally get a bit more time and you generally get a bit more money. That is not the case for most primary schools. They're just sort of given this. And I think that that needs to be managed really carefully. And so um, what I see schools doing this well in terms of management is they're saying, right, we're going to use the next two or three staff meetings and we're going to focus on history. So the history lead is going to find some great texts and we're all going to talk about them, we're going to work up units together. 
from year one to year six, okay? So that we are understanding where this is coming from. And once we've got those principles in place, we might then take another story. I'm thinking sort of um, Great Fire of London, some wonderful resources around there. And that, that is then used for key stage one possibly, but then the, another unit might be used across key stage two while we're getting to grips with this. So being really pragmatic about getting some deep work going, but then making sure we squeeze the juice out of it. So if we're working up something new, why can't the whole of, of um, I don't know what it would be outside of England, we would call it key stage two. So that would be from year three to year six. Um, I'd need to be educated on what that age group was over in the States. Um, and then we, we work through in this rigorous way, building our knowledge as we go, rather than trying to do everything trying to do everything at once, fewer things in greater depth, underpinned by a great story, fabulous talk, and then layering stuff on top of that, like wonderful art, wonderful music, um, et cetera. So I'll just give you a quick example that, you know, the colleagues I was working with this morning, we were talking about the first story of um, creation in Genesis 1 as part of a Christianity unit. So there are two, there are two accounts. I just took the first one. Um, and um, underpinned by two different accounts of, of um, that, layered with some art. Why would you not include, would you include Michelangelo, as I initially tried to in the Sistine Chapel, based on that, then I realized it was full of willies and buttocks, so I had to find something else. Um, <laughs> why, not, why, not, why not include fabulous art, which I found some from the 15th century? Um, layering on this richness why wouldn't we include um giving children opportunities to listen to haydn's creation why wouldn't we give them opportunities to research how the bible came to be written initially in hebrew for the jewish community and so you know you're layering on this stuff rather than trying to do mickey mouse things of you know loads of worksheets and things but people need to know that stuff. I mean, what you're saying there sounds really good, but you know those things. And my, 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 my sort of uh, observation is that, like, not every school has the people who know what, you're, what you know. And, and, it's, and so, that, I mean, Emmy, you probably know more about this than well, I do. But... I was just about to say, one of the most successful things that we did at the school where I did the co-headship was we used to have sports day, and then at lunchtime, most of the children would go home or we'd get our HLTAs to, to, to look after the rest of the children for the rest of the day towards the end of the term. And as a collective, we came together in the hall or one of the classrooms and we planned our units for the next year together, all of us. So all of us knew what every single class would be doing. Yeah. And then every single person in that room has got a degree in something. They are all specialists in something. They may not teach to a specialist secondary level, but they have all studied tertiary education to a to degree level and also we brought in specialist TAs that one was a one was a sculptor so she you know she came in and she contributed to the conversation about the art and design curriculum we knew our staff we knew their skills and when we planned for the year at the at that in that summer thing that was the richest point of the year because it was academic intellectual conversation led by qualified professionals and people were saying oh well I was going to do this in history Somebody with a history of degrees, like, oh, God, don't do that. Don't that. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And somebody be like, well, I've read this book that goes beautifully with your unit. Just because you're in a year group in a, in a primary school, so that doesn't mean you, you're there forever. One of the greatest strengths of primary teachers is they move around in the school and get this wonderful progression model in terms of child development and curriculum progression. And they can mentally scroll backwards and forwards of where these children are going. That, like Mary said, that collective point where you come together and you pull those intellectual and academic resources is so, so rich. And it was, it works an absolute treat. So I was nodding along there, Mary, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, like, here's the thing. So I, I, I'm really interested in this. Um, it's interesting because you, your, your two books subtitles, one of them is, well, no, well, there's, there's Gallimorphy to Coherence. There's a whole curriculum. Curriculum is the main title, isn't it? And it's all about coherence making it all add up to something that's more than the sum of its parts and the more recent one which is back on track fewer things greater depth now that applies to a lot of things but in, in, including in the curriculum one of the things i'm interested in is kind of what that looks like in practice so you just mentioned the fire of london for example so i mean you could you could prepare for a university challenge quiz on the fire of london kind of thing 
But there is a danger that if, so there's a knowledge element, but then it's a knowing what to put in and what not. And then there's a danger that you end up doing a kind of, I don't know, a nice kind of, I don't know, poster or something you've made, which is a fire and it's about some houses on fire, but you don't really know, like children can do the fire of London without, and then two years later, they just remembered we did the fire of London, but what, what would you want them to hold on to? I, I think this is a real tension. I think not everyone knows the answer to that. What would you be saying? Well, I'd shift the language, first of all. So I, I, I get a bit um, itchy when I hear we're doing the fire of Lan London or we're doing Judaism. It's like, or the Romans, I'm thinking, oh, poor Jewish people, poor Romans. Why do they want to be done to? We're not doing them. We're learning about them. And we've got to be really clear about what we want children to have learned as a result of what they've been taught. And so um, quite often this can be diluted when we start doing posters, when we start making fires. I had a classic one where I was um, talking to some children when um, they'd been learning about um, uh, Judaism. And I said, oh, tell me what you've been learning about Judaism. They said, well, we've been learning about the synagogue. So I said, oh, marvellous. Tell me what you've been learning about the Jewish people in the synagogue. They said, we've made one. I said, fantastic. Um, so tell me what you've been learning about the Jewish people in the synagogue as a result of making one. And they said, well, it's made out of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> so we end up with a cardboard curriculum. So it's about this intentionality again. What do I want my children to remember in the long term? And as a professional, I'm going to identify the main things I want them to know as a result of the fire of London that will be deep in their DNA um, so that they can draw on that in the future if they choose or to take it further if they choose. And so we move beyond the superficial to get to the heart to get to the heart of the matter and that takes a little bit of time it takes a little bit of discipline but the, fundamentally it's saying well what do I want my children to have learned as a result of this and what are they going to produce so um, and I think it's useful to think of products actually and Tim Oates um, who led on the national curriculum in England um, the review of the national curriculum um, in 2013 was that um, you know, we, we've got insights into whether our children have learned something through the things that they produce. So it could be their talk, it could be an extended piece of writing, it could be low stakes quizzes, it could be an artifact, it could be one of many things that gives us insights into whether children have learned something or not. So if, they, if, they're, if they're making fires, I think making fires is a great thing, but what's it got to do with the fire of London would be the question I would want to be asking. But if they're making posters, so what is that product showing that they have learned? Was it just a nice proxy? Actually, it's not a particularly nice proxy. Most posters are scrappy. But, you know, so what is the product is going to come out of this learning um, is a useful question to ask. And it might not be physical. It might just be talk. But that is still evidence, I would argue. Mm. What do you what do you think, Emma? Is, is that something? Oh, that... I'm just listening along because one of the slides that I use on my training is I talk about the Colosseum and Florence Nightingale. And my daughter, my eldest daughter, sharp as attack, did this lesson, which sounds very much like your cardboard synagogue, Mary. And she made a Colosseum, couldn't tell me anything about the Romans, couldn't, but it could tell me that Liv got covered in glue and somebody had done this and somebody had done that. And then my middle daughter, who is prem baby, hard of hearing, all sorts of things, and um, all sorts of problems with with um, learning academia had done a conversation with her teacher in a, in a group at Florence Nightingale and she could regale me with every single fact about Florence Nightingale from that it was in in Turkey mummy in Turkey not a turkey that you eat a turkey is a place where you go through to when it was and and how she, Florence Nightingale was a wonderful female character and because she did things that ladies didn't normally do back then and I was thinking you're five years old and I said, what did your teacher do? She said, we sat in a circle, we watched a little bit of a programme and we talked about it and we asked questions. And I thought that, that lesson probably took five, ten minutes to actually resource, but actually the knowledge of the teacher has brought this child, who isn't necessarily brilliant academically, has come out of school absolutely buzzing. My eldest one, who by rights should be able to, you know, uh, remember everything, could only remember if she got covered in glue. And it's a story about on all of my training um, about curriculum and about in being intentional with what you want the children to remember because it was just 
brought, you know, writ large there in front of me at the school gate. I thought, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've, I've, I have this feeling that I, we, 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 we kind of need to draw things to a close in a minute. So I, I'm going to just ask Mary to, I mean, we, we, you know, we, a lot of people uh, love your book Back on Track because it, it does give them the, the sort of, it, it, it does really encourage people to say what it says in the subtitle, fewer things in greater depth. And you always have this quality all the way through it. And it has the same style as your other book, which is, you know, short chapters, which are very punchy. Um, and I would recommend anyone uh, listening to, to go and, and read it. And um, it's, it's so interesting. So it's, it's got this sort of human aspect about, I, lo I love this whole, this whole concept where you talk about humans first, professionals second. And you even do that in your talks, like making sure people have this, when we're discussing these hard issues, remember who we are. I love that, the spirit. But, but, so I could wax lyrical about it, but just just as a little wrapping up thing, maybe what what would you want main, mainly people to take from it? What's your kind of main message? Do you think the main message is that we all actually know what it's worth working on? <laughs> we do. It's not. This isn't news to anyone, and to start calling that out, you know, and, and I, I do mean everyone within the sector, you know, whether you're a trainee, whether you're a newly qualified teacher, whether you've been doing it for nearly 30 years, like I have that, you know, if it's not adding value to children's learning, asking that question, why are we doing this? Because there's a huge amount of activity going on in school and we've lost the reason why we're doing it um, or we've got our priorities wrong. We're doing it for external um, uh, eyes and ex external accountability. And my view is, is that the only, my only constituency are the children who are in front of me. So I'm not marking for parents. I'm not marking for Ofsted or the inspectorate. I'm gonna do what is right for my children. And to, to cut through just some of the processes which we know are bloated. And we've all got the right to us to do that. So that's what I hope people take away. And I think the final thing to, to, to draw on, and I've drawn a lot on Greg McCann's work, um, who is well known um, both in this country and in and the States and his essentialism, but also Pareto's broad rule, 80% comes from about 20% of the input. Let's just focus on that 20% to get the really great work coming out. So, and relax into it, you know, um, so let's beat ourselves up, you know, take this one day at a time is what I hope they take from it. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Um, and thank you to everyone listening and watching. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe. And if you, uh, you know, read Mary's books, you're going to take a lot away from them. And it's really a real pleasure to talk to you today. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. It's been brilliant. <laughs>